when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds, large crowds followed him. They still do today, by the way. 2.2 billion estimated adherents to the cause of Christ. Crowds are still interested in who Jesus Christ is, even if some of them only know him as a swear word. The truth is, he has something to say and commands our attention. So he comes down from the mountaintop and large crowds followed him. And a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone. Pause. See that you don't tell anyone. But go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Jesus is not about sensationalism. Anybody working in miracle or supernatural power, it's not about the worker of the miracle to become sensational. The miracles that we will read of in this reading will show us that Jesus is not looking for theater. He's looking for salvation, healing, the works of God to put things right that have gone wrong. So don't show yourself, don't tell other people, go straight to the priest, as the scriptures really would command you. But go show yourself to the priest and offer, offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony. Because I'm reading, I'm just wanting not to lose this. Go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift to Moses. Learning to honor the Lord with deep gratitude is what that was all about. Moses taught the people who suffered different plagues, and particularly with leprosy, if they should come into a healing and if God should heal them, and the circumstances change, there's a process you should go through, and it's teaching you to honor the Lord and express gratitude. Give thanks to the Lord. Hello? Yeah. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And giving thanks becomes a testimony to the healing power of God, authentic testimony. It's very hard to deny miracle when you witness miracle in your life. It's very hard to deny miracle when your testimony is the Lord intervened, right? And I have no embarrassment about that. Nothing sensational. But the reality is that God can intervene into our situations. And then, as he tells him to go to the priest, that has some ramifications for us today in our Christian walk, and we'll look at that later. Verse 5, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. I'd love to have a master like that who cares. Wouldn't you? He's suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. You speak it, Lord, it'll come to pass. You don't have to come physically. Your word is as good as your presence. You speak your word, Lord, and you can bring healing. You speak your word, Lord, you can unlock the situation. You are the commander-in-chief 
And I understand what authority is about because I'm also a man under authority. And he recognized that Jesus operated under the authority of his Father. He knew that Jesus was submissive to the will of the Father. So you just say the word, Lord. And my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. I'd really like to amaze Jesus, wouldn't you? That is some credibility. Jesus is amazed, and he said to those following him, truth I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Why are you saying that, Lord? Because I expect that of Israel. But this is a Gentile. And this Gentile believes God more than my people do. This is faith. Don't get accustomed to the supernatural. Don't become cynical as a Christian. And don't tell me that there's no such thing as a Christian cynic. There are so many of them about. If I'm a believer, I must believe. Correct? Praise the Lord, I'm a believer. That's why I like that monkey song. Hey there, I'm a believer. Anyone in Israel, I've not seen it with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east, the west, will take their places in the feast with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, in the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying to Israel, to the church of that day, he's saying, I want you to know that I have not even started yet. What I will accomplish by my kingdom will affect the whole wide world. It's a big family we belong to. From every nation under the sun, there'll be those who bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12, but the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus said to the centurion, go, I, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. I rehearse occasionally, uh, quietly to people, some of the instantaneous moments that I have witnessed of God's healing. I was talking to you in a few uh, weeks ago when we were in a tent meeting and how God healed the hands of a young man who was being rather ruffian. That's my word, you know, rough. And he had all of these sores all over his hands that looked like warts to me. And he didn't believe in God. And I said to him, do you know God could heal you right now? He said, stretch out your hand. And, and he just laughingly stretched out his, hand, his hands. And they were instantaneously healed. God can do it. It's not too difficult for the Lord to do it. Are you hearing me? Did I hear an amen? Amen. We just know that he can do it in a moment. When, verse 14, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. And when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove the spirits with a word and healed the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, he took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. This is a wonderful statement of the authority of Christ to heal the sick. I respect authority. I just want you to know that I believe there's authority in the church, in its leadership. I respect godly authority. I'm also a man under authority. And I believe that we must always pray for those who are in authority, even the scoundrels.
pray that God might arrest the soul, if not remove them out of the way. But in these chapters that we've read so far, the first four chapters, we've looked at the authenticity of Christ. Beautiful uh, first four chapters that we looked at. In chapters 5 to 7, we're introduced to the attributes of the kingdom, qualities, values, virtues, what it means to be a born-again believer, put it in that terminology, what it means not just to be an attendee, but to be fully committed to serving the King. There are certain qualities that will come amongst us by the work of the Spirit. In chapters 8 to 9, we're introduced to the authority of Christ. And this is very important that we respect Him in the realm of the supernatural. In fact, what follows are ten miracles in the next two chapters of Matthew's accounts. He likes to group things together, and he, he groups these ten miracles, and it reveals something of the power and authority of Christ being demonstrated. Let me just say this. In all of the fears of the coronavirus that's about it all over the world, all over the world, it just shows you how weak we are, doesn't it? How desperate we need God. Because on our own, with all the wealth, with all the experience, with all the technology, we've still got a learning plate on, an L plate, right? There's so much we don't know, but everything could, could be brought to a halt. Just like that. That's why we come before the Lord as we've been told with praise and prayer and worship and practical responsibility, right? But the truth is, Jesus has the authority over all sickness, over all demons, over all powers. He is the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And that's what we're reading here in Matthew. He's presenting this regalness of Christ in how he operates. And the miracles in themselves are a sign, a witness, a testimony to such power that Jesus operates in. But also by being a sign, they're also a judgment. They bring about a judgment. Because there are people who say, I don't believe in the supernatural. In our sophisticated world, we don't believe in demons. That's because we're stupid. There are demonic activities about in our world. Disease is part of it. There's plenty of demonic activity, just a bit more sophisticated. When I operated in ministry, helping people unlock people, it depended what part of the country, what kind of lockup I was dealing with that was demonic. It would be sophisticated in more areas where the mind played more than the emotions. But Jesus, when he comes to deliver the miraculous demonstration of his power, the first thing he comes up against is the cynicism and the unbelief that is amongst the people that should know better. And it's easy for us to become in a culture of disbelief or unbelief, even though we've got all the scriptures and all of the prophetic statements. So, ten miracles... Number 10 is an interesting number of governance. But the 10 miracles, he's showing us the power, the comprehensive way in which Jesus can bring about salvation to our hurting humanity. It's a mistake to believe that God has not revealed himself. On the contrary, religious rulers of the day attributed the demonstration of Jesus' acts to the works of the devil. We have to be very careful when we demonize people to win an argument. When we undermine other people's integrity just to look strong. You know what I'm saying? We have to be very careful. Verse 31 of Matthew 9, But they went out and spread the news about him all over the region while they were going out. A man who was demon-possessed could not talk, was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute, spoke. And the crowd was so amazed and said, nothing like this 
has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, it's by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow, this fellow, who is this fellow? The Lord of lords and the King of kings, the most dignified human being in eternity. Amen? Amen. The greatest king of all. I'm not supposed to lift my hands too high, you know, since they've given me this digital apparatus. But who is this fellow? Glad you asked. He is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. No man can come to the Father unless they come by him. So even when he's operating in the miraculous, there's disbelief in the camp. And often the unbeliever believes more than the believer. He came to his own, it says in the Gospels, and his own received him not. But to those that received him, he gave the power, the authority to be called the children of God, sons, male and female of God. I thank God. I thank God. It's not of my righteousness. It's of his authority that I'm a child of the King because I embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, as I know so many of you do. But the play in Matthew is on the authority of his word. The attack today in our society is on the validity of the Bible. There are even Christian institutions that will put aside what the Bible says on matters of life and death, on matters of gender, on matters of health. People say, we'll prosecute you if you preach that. Well, two hoots to prosecution. The issue is, the word of the Lord is sure. How you use the word of the Lord is the issue. That you don't become cruel and demonize people, but accept the fact that you are who you are by the grace of God, right? So the story here is about believing and getting rid of disbelief. And so we've got it right in this sense of personal inadequacy in a leper who comes, I love the way he does this, he came, verse 2, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He knelt down, humbled himself. Who are we dealing with here? An outcast. A man who had to ring a bell and admit he was unclean in the public arena. There's been some awful reactions to people, even on the coronavirus, let me tell you, where people are, are, are treated wrongly. Listen to me, don't point the finger. This man has been outside of the camp. He's not been able to be with his family. He's less than the lowest. He is the untouchable. And he comes to Jesus, and all he needs, more than anything else, to do his emotions good at least, is someone to touch him. So I understand him. When he kneels before the king, and he says, if you are willing, he's finding it hard to believe that God is willing. He can believe in miracles. But the issue is not about can God do the miracle, is is God willing to do a miracle for me? Can God touch me? If you have the heart for it, Lord, you can make me clean. You are my priest. You are my spiritual father. If you could touch me, if you are willing, Lord, you could make me clean. And Jesus 
as he's saying it, reaches out his hand before he's explaining it, and he says, I am willing, and his willingness is in the touch. He touched him. Don't go through life without a touch from God. Please, please don't you disqualify yourself. My father for years, he was a nice man. Everybody loved my dad. You say, do you believe in God, dad? Yeah, I believe in God. But he agreed with everything, but never surrendered his life until he hit a crisis. And the day he hit a crisis, I saw my dad break his heart, and I saw him come to know Jesus. Totally transformed his life. Because for the first time in his life, he accepted that God still accepted him, even though he didn't accept himself. Right? So to this leper, I am willing. God is not willing. God is not willing that any man should perish, but that all might have eternal life. Are you hearing me? You can sit in a church. You can read the Bible, you can sing the hymns, you can be religious as ever, but there comes a time when you need a touch from God. When God comes to you and deep within your sense and in your soul, in the core of your being, you've got to get over yourself. Stop disqualifying yourself. So many people have done it, Alan. You don't know what it's like to be an outsider. You don't know what it's like to believe in myself. Nobody else has believed. All I've had to say is, look how unclean I am. And God says, that's the material I can touch. Humble yourself. Perhaps today, it's time to humble yourself. You're in this crowd today. It's time to say, Lord, it's time for me. I want you to come into my life. I want you to come in today. I want you to touch my inferiority. I want you to to touch my history. and Set me free from that which has held me down. I want you to wash me and make me clean. And all he did was humble himself. Why is it that pride is not just superiority complex? It's also inferiority complex. Why is it that you can have a pride that's inward? Only you're just little old Jew. God is not interested in you. Come on now, what do you want him to do for you? He was strung up on a cross. He was called a demon-possessed man. All because he came into our demon-possessed world to show mercy and grace. And he reached out and he touched the leper. All of humanity, whatever might be their lacks and their failings, are loved by God. God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that he who would believe in him shall have life and life everlasting. Don't look so miserable. Come on now. This is a wonderful gospel. The power of God's word. The power of God's work. Salvation work. To make a turnaround inside. Don't be, don't, let me come back at this. Don't hide behind inferiority. Oh God, only if, if, just, if you were just willing, God. Stop sucking your thumb. That's pride. Humble yourself. Lord, I open up my heart to you today. Come into my life. Come in to stay. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. People believe in the miraculous power, but readily, more readily than they do the miraculous compassion of Christ, said somebody. The miraculous compassion of Christ. Jesus You've just touched that leper. You should have elbowed him or touched him with your foot. 
Jesus, you've just touched a viral infection. He healed him. Set him free. And he was so overflowing. He didn't listen to what Jesus says. Go, because you know your Bible. Go, Leviticus 14. If you get healed from leprosy, come to the priest. And tell the priest a miracle has taken place. And then the priest will check you out. And then the priest will allow you to give sacrifices to say thank you to God. And also he'll let you do in the first eight verses of Leviticus 14 in the scriptures that God had taught his people. You can take the simplest of sacrifice, two birds, and take one bird and sacrifice that bird with the blood and the water and the oil and then dip the bird in the oil and in the water and in the blood, the bird that's still alive. And make sure it's got some hyssop and a piece of cedar wood so that when you release this bird out of its cage, it's got the smell of cedar wood. And everybody knows that cedar wood does not decompose. Decom what's the word? Decompose. Post. Got it? You know what I'm saying? Right. It doesn't putrefy. But the fact it's been washed in blood and water and anointed and released, it's a statement of things to come that God has a sacrifice that will make you clean. And that sacrifice is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he will die that you might live. And his blood, oh, the blood of Jesus, washes white as snow. It was a drama, a dramatic statement that the priest makes of the greater reality to come in Jesus Christ, that by the shedding of his blood, he'll heal the sick and he'll bring to life that which is dead in our humanity. The bed that's released is like Romans 12 verse 1 in the resurrection to serve its master, present to you. I present to you, Lord, my life. You took me when I was a nobody and you made me somebody. I thank you, Lord, when you educated me in your word. I thank you for the people that have gone before that taught me to pray and believe that you could answer prayer. I thank you, Lord, when you said to me that you're not to have a poverty spirit, but you're to be generous. You're to serve me all the days of your life. I said, thank you, Lord. You set me free that I might worship you and honor you with all the authority that you have. Cleansing the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. I never understood it when I was younger. Why do they talk about the blood all the time? Have you seen how bloody he became? Have you seen what they did with him to crown him with thorns and torture him? He's a great savior. And this leper kneels down. Thank you, Lord. When we know that without you, we are nothing. But we don't make the excuse of living in our inferiority. We humble ourselves. We confess who you are. Then the centurion, just say the word. I love the word. I love the word. I love the Bible that was, I don't know if you've ever seen it, there's a Bible produced, and it's called The Voice. I love the voice. I know God's voice better than I know other people's. It's just the way he speaks. He gives you answers to things you can't work out. Doesn't he? You know, he orders your steps, but you don't know he's ordering your steps because he doesn't want you to fall over him. 
Later on you look back and you say, look, look, see how God led me. I being in the way the Lord led me. Every step of a righteous man is ordered by the Lord. He's a good God. His voice is real. Centurion said, come on now, I, may, I understand kingdom language. I understand that you're the king. I want to submit to your word. Because you say the command, Lord. That's what he meant. You give the decree, Lord, and it shall be. Come on, let's get back. Not to sensationalism. But to genuine, humble belief that God is a good God. And that God can heal the sick. God can set the captive free. God can give you hope in life where you've lacked hope. Even though people have abused you, God can heal you of that abuse. He's a good God. I have witnessed. All my days I've witnessed the faithfulness of the Lord. Comprehensive provision. Whether you're a leper or you're a high-up centurion, God is no respecter of persons. Don't tell anyone. Go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. James says this, if anybody's sick, let him call for the priest. You say, well, I believe in the priesthood of all believers. So do I. I have no problem with the priesthood of all believers, but I also believe in godly appointed authority in the community of the church. I believe in the call of God. I would not be where I am today in ministry if it wasn't for the call of God. This was not my choice. It was, this was a command. Somebody said to me once, I'd like you to make my son an elder in the church. And I said, well, does he have a call? What do you mean a call? Exactly what I'm saying. You do not want to be in a leadership of any church unless the call of God is on your life. And when the call of God is on your life, it humbles you because you know that you're under a commanding officer. Even your attitude, when you want to, you feel like you want to tell somebody something, and God says, that's not for you to do. You hear me? We're in a kingdom. We are priests and kings unto God. Aren't we? Did I hear an amen? Are you struggling? So Matthew grasps this, and what he's conveying in the stories he's telling is the word of authority and power that Jesus carries. And we need to learn to respect, to be humble, to operate in meekness, and know that God is willing. Listen to me carefully. The greatest enemy of your soul is yourself. You have to tame yourself. God hears your prayer. Hello? I, I don't know I've ever told you this, but uh, I thank God God didn't answer one of my prayers with yes. I was about to propose to somebody to marry them. And they were not the right person for me. And the Lord had to tell me no. And I wanted a yes. But look what I would have missed out on. If I hadn't have found Betty, where would I be today? Right? The love of my life. Why? Because she's been a faithful friend. And a very beautiful person. Right? So sometimes it's God not being angry with you. It's God being wise. Some things God doesn't say yes to. But what he does do is he hears your prayer. And he hears your cry. I come to you today. The authority of Christ is because he is the creator of the universe. And he's the savior of our soul. And God help us for the churches that deny the word of God. The under-narrative that we carry must not be inferiority. Look at me, please. We have whites of your eyes. Let me see you. 
we must respect one another and respect ourselves. God loves us. We are the apple of his eye. Anybody pokes that, they're in trouble. Right? We're very special people. I come to the conclusion. Just as I am, without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me, and that you bid me come to you, O Lamb of God, I come. If you don't know Jesus, come. If you love Jesus, come. Stop disqualifying yourself. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. I used to say to people that were harassed, as Christians even, in their own soul, couldn't forgive themselves for the things they'd done wrong as believers. I said, you know what you need to do? You need to sit on the floor rather than lie on the bed or go down on your knees and take a, a hymn like this and pray it to the Lord. And you watch what will happen? The Lord will turn up. And as the Lord turns up, you'll start to cry because you know he's forgiving you because he's just and faithful if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just as I am poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because your promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. You mind me reading this hymn to you? Just as I am of that free love, free love, thank you, Lord. The breadth, the length, the depth, the height to prove. Here for a season, then above, O Lamb of God, I come. I read this chapter, and there's so much I could say. But what grips my heart is how up close and personal God is to every one of us. You don't have to shout, He can hear you whisper. Let's stand before the Lord. Just before we sing together, I'm just going to pray with us. I don't always pray with my eyes closed. I mostly pray with my eyes open. I'm going to ask you for a moment just to close your eyes as you stand before the Lord and just reflect on the scripture a moment. Come right back to that humble position before the Lord, grateful for what he's done for you. Would you do that right now? And if you are here today in this gathering and you'd like to surrender your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, just raise your hand for me and say, that's me, Alan. I want you to know that's me. God bless you. I see you. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. Just repeat this prayer before the Lord with an open heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Forgive me for my failings. Forgive me for my weaknesses. I want you to be the Lord and Master of my life from this day forward. 
because I believe in you. I believe in you. Fill me with your peace. Anoint me with your spirit. And I'll be careful to give you all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and confess with your mouth you shall be saved. Tell the person closest to you in praying that prayer. Say, I want you to know today I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my heart. Just tell the person, confess with your mouth, and the peace of God will visit you. And you'll feel so different, and i tell you why. Because he's touched you, and you've responded to him.